Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, the devil's in the details. The hallways in the State House are abuzz with activity, but is a budget deal being worked out behind closed doors? The sports betting regulation bill passes both houses of the legislature unanimously, but sports betting might start before the governor even signs it into law. The latest weapon in fighting the opioid epidemic, the DEA deploys its 360 strategy in the city of Newark. They do arts and crafts, play sports, dance. Old Bridge Play Unified is creating lifelong friendships among the students here in the district. Plus, it's a two for one bill. Combines expanding medicinal marijuana with legalizing recreational weed. And a team of Budweiser's great big Clydesdales thundered by. We'll tell you where they were and why. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. A frantic day in Trenton with several key bills up for votes in the Senate and Assembly, but dominating the conversation is talk of a potential budget deal. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. We're standing in the legislative branch right now. Kids taking the tour of the State House today were treated to an up close look at how state government works, at least how it appears to work to the outside world. But in the relative privacy of the caucus rooms, away from the impressionable eyes of the children, lawmakers are said to be dangerously close to a final budget deal or ultimatum, depending on who you talk to. Well, as far as I know, we've been negotiating and um, <clears throat> we've been making strides. On the record, that's what all the lawmakers we talked to were saying on this frantic afternoon. But off the record, the word is that both houses have agreed on the parameters of a budget. The details are sketchy, but the spending plan does not appear to include the governor's millionaire's tax, an increase in the sales tax, or some of his other priorities, like funding for community college tuition. The negotiations are... Ongoing, uh, we've established a budget committee date for uh, June 19th, Tuesday, June 19th. I've notified my members uh, that we will have a budget and committee. Sources say a version of Senate President Steve Sweeney's tax on million dollar corporations is the revenue generator the legislative leaders have agreed to. I mean, I think every day you get a little bit closer uh, to uh, resolving. Um, these issues, it's a give and take like every other budget year. Just you know, a little bit more heightened for you guys this year because it's a Democrat governor and Democratic legislature and a new Democratic governor. But, uh, you know, listen, I think I'm comfortable we're going to get there. Today otherwise looked like a typical Thursday voting session with lawmakers running the gauntlet of lobbyists and others. Meanwhile, the Legislative Black Caucus presented its annual list of priorities as party leaders huddled in another part of the State House, unlikely to have heard what was said at this sparsely attended press conference. We're going to work on information, but I can say this to you, um, not the caucus. I would ask the caucus if, in fact, things are not going the way we think they should be going with participation, that we do what we did in the past, that we don't take a personal vote because a personal vote may be a yay or nay. We take a caucus vote, a, a vote to do nothing until somebody talk to us. Progressives who have waited for the day when Democrats had all this control could see a lot of their priorities fall by the wayside too, especially if they cost anything like community college tuition. They're still talking revenue raisers, even as legislative leaders seem to declare taxes a four-letter word. Most unfortunate that it's mostly men. I think that if we had more female legislators, we would be better off. The three principals, the Senate president, assembly speaker, and governor are scheduled to meet again tomorrow. One senator said that the version that they present to the governor tomorrow is the final version. He can take out whatever he wants, said another, but he can't put anything in, which is true, except that there are still about three weeks left to negotiate. At the State House, I'm David Cruz and JTV News.
a marijuana measure that's expected to generate as much as $300 million in revenue is being repackaged. The state senator leading the charge on legal weed is poised to introduce a new two-in-one plan that would both expand medical marijuana and legalize recreational marijuana. State Senator Nicholas Gutari's bill calls for 218 marijuana dispensaries in all, 120 of them recreational, 98 of them medical. But since the idea of a merged bill hasn't been well received, Scutari is also expected to introduce two other bills that address medical and recreational cannabis separately. It's going to expand the current medicinal program significantly. Uh, it's going to allow for some of these current medicinal providers to go live right away uh, so that uh, we can get this illegality off the streets as soon as possible. There's no reason to have separate conversations with respect to expansion of medical marijuana and legalization of marijuana to begin with. It's really one topic, quite frankly, and that's why we're going to do it in this fashion. We're going to get to the right uh, sponsors. We've had personal conversations with the speaker who seems to be on board with the concept, certainly the concept of legalization, uh, and we're going to work on this consolidated bill with him. As a candidate, Phil Murphy pledged not to divert funds earmarked for affordable housing to plug holes in the general fund. But his proposed state budget would take money from both the trust fund and the state housing and mortgage financing agency, nearly $78 million in all, and use it for other housing-related programs. The president and CEO of the Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey calls the diversion distressing. At a Rutgers Eagleton poll shows 79 percent of New Jersey residents want the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to be used solely for building affordable homes. The public interest polling director is Ashley Conan. There's a real driving force widespread across New Jerseyans that this fund should be used for its intended purposes. And there's a lot of concern among New Jerseyans about costs of housing, uh, worrying about affording housing in the future. Three quarters worry a lot, or at least some, that they'll be able to afford something in the next three to five years. And about nine in 10 say that it's difficult to find housing that's affordable and that it's a big, serious problem in New Jersey. A package of gun safety measures has cleared a Senate vote, the last hurdle before they head to the governor's desk to be signed into law. They would ban armor-piercing bullets and magazines over 10 rounds, require background checks for all private gun sales, and tighten rules for concealed carry handgun permits, let family members ask a judge to seize someone's guns for up to a year if they're a threat to themselves or others, or if there's a restraining order against them, and require law enforcement to confiscate a person's guns if a mental health professional determines they pose a threat to themselves or others. A bill banning child marriages has passed the Assembly. Having already passed the Senate, the current law allows marriage or civil union licenses to be issued to 16 or 17-year-olds with the consent of a parent, a guardian, or a judge. The new law would bar anyone under the age of 18 from getting a marriage license, whether or not they have consent. Former Governor Christie conditionally vetoed similar legislation last year, citing respect for religious customs. Lawmakers have said they're confident Governor Murphy will sign this one into law. A bill that would legalize sports betting sailed through both the Senate and Assembly. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was there to watch the landmark legislation approved. I declare the bill passed. Let the bill take the usual course of passed bills. Both the Assembly and the Senate unanimously passed an amended bill to regulate and tax sports betting in New Jersey just weeks after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled it's legal. Watching closely was former Senator Ray Lesniak, who started the ball rolling in the courts and collected hugs and congratulations. Our casinos and our racetrack need new fans and new revenues. And people will flock to the racetracks and the casinos to put a bet in on their favorite sport team. With the renaissance of Atlantic City that's occurring now, with the state intervention, with the entering of two new properties, sports betting is going to complement bringing these additional visitors to our town. The bill does not include an integrity fee for major league sports. It permits sports betting parlors at casinos and racetracks and online, although Internet sports wagers won't be accepted until 30 days after the bill signed into law. It's expected to generate $13 million in state revenue next fiscal year and cuts a slice away from the illegal sports betting market. Uh, this is an important step because it takes this industry operating in the shadows, moves it into the economy, 
where there can be benefit not only for taxation, for programs that are worthy. One amendment will let Atlantic City's Golden Nugget owner, Tillman Fertitta, keep his Houston Rockets basketball team and still take sports bets at the Nugget, as long as they're not wagered on any NBA games. Another critical amendment removed the so-called poison pill provision, which would let venues open to take sports bets even before the governor signs the bill into law. That's crucial because sources in the governor's office say he may not sign this bill until next week at the earliest, and Monmouth Park is ready to go. I've been chomping at the bit, so to speak, to open for weeks now. Uh, the poison pill is out now, so we're going to do everything we can to get open, so we're trying to make this happen. Uh, we have a partner, William Hill, that needs to get corporate clearance. That's all I'm waiting on. Dennis Drazen runs Monmouth Park, and he's anxious to get started at the park's William Hill Sports Betting Lounge, where the tote board showed live odds and tellers trained to take wagers. It's a big sports weekend coming up, and this is the only sports betting venue in Jersey that's ready to go. You can ask all of our tellers who've been through extensive training the last two weeks to kind of help you on how to make a sports bet in New Jersey. And I'm looking to place the first bet at Monmouth Racetrack. 40 to 1 odds for the Giants to win the Super Bowl. I'm in. Delaware's already taking sports bets, $320,000 worth on Tuesday. Could the governor use Jersey's sports betting bill as leverage in budget negotiations? Nobody's giving odds on that game. At the State House in Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan and JTV News. One budget proposal is getting pushback from a business group. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, state lawmakers are getting the full court press from New Jersey's business leaders over the prospects of new taxes. The Chamber of Commerce and the New Jersey Business and Industry Association oppose the millionaire's tax or increasing the corporate business tax. Today, the NJBIA released data showing that taxpayers are leaving the state, costing New Jersey billions of dollars in income. NJBIA President and CEO Michelle Sikirka says higher taxes would cause further damage. We've heard of a proposal to increase the corporate business tax here in the state of New Jersey. The current rate is 9 percent. The proposal is to increase that to 12 percent. If we do that, we're going to be tied for last in the nation with Iowa. And what's even more important is we are significantly more le less competitive with our region. So our number one and number two out migration states, Pennsylvania and New York, we lack competitiveness um, in all these areas. And in CBT, our biggest concern is that we have 2,400 businesses that would be impacted by an increase in corporate business tax. And that's the amount of $21 billion that's at play. So again, when we know that we have an out-migration issue from the start, um, when we now talk about piling on more taxes to New Jersey's largest companies, we have a concern that they're either going to leave or they're going to stop growing in the state of New Jersey. This is something we should pay attention to. Meantime, Chamber President and CEO Tom Brackett is meeting with lawmakers tomorrow and is remaining realistic about the budget process and the possibility of higher taxes. There's strain in the budget to fund existing programs. So when you have that strain, you know, you, you we have to balance the budget and there has to be some money generated someplace. So I think there's probably a better than uh, normal, uh, better than average chance that some increase will take place. Um, and uh, our, our suggestion, once we find out what that is, is to find out how we can incorporate whatever increase is implemented into some bigger picture, bigger picture plan that really uh, will sooner rather than later help spur on the economy. In other news, the industrial equipment company Fortive has offered Johnson & Johnson $2.7 billion to buy its advanced sterilization products unit. New Brunswick-based J&J has four months to decide whether to accept that offer. J&J has been selling off some of its businesses to focus on higher growth areas. On Wall Street today, stocks closed mixed. The Dow rose 95 points. And those are our top business stories. Jersey City plans to tackle the litter, waste, and environmental contamination caused by those single-use disposable plastic bags by banning them. 
The mayor announced the ordinance today. The city council scheduled a hearing next Wednesday. Long Beach, Longport, Teaneck, and Ventnor have already passed ordinances to either ban plastic carryout bags or place a fee on their use. And Assemblyman John McKeon's introduced a bill that would phase them out entirely over three years. In Newark, a concerted effort to stop the expansion of heroin and its deadly consequences. Brianna Venosi reports on the DEA's effort to help curb New Jersey's drug addiction crisis. I walked into bathrooms where my mother would have a rubber band stuck to her. She had track marks all over and uh, she was overdosing. With the opioid epidemic at an all-time high, stories like that of Pablo Pizarro told this morning at a DEA press conference in Newark are becoming all too common and breaking the cycle of violence and addiction generated by drugs becoming increasingly difficult. I've seen my father put a fork in her ear and blow her eardrums open. I've seen my father hit her with a bat, intoxicated and blow her kneecap. I should have been a drug addict. I should have been in the streets, but today I'm trying to fight for the very same kids that saw or seen what I saw. Newark is now the ninth city in the U.S. designated under the Drug Enforcement Administration's 360 strategy, a comprehensive three-pronged approach to help cities grappling with severe rates of heroin and prescription drug abuse. DEA does one thing very well, drug enforcement. But we recognize that this <clears throat> issue is much larger and more complex and enforcement alone is not enough to make lasting changes in our communities. The program focuses on enforcement, keeping drugs out of the community and cracking down on trafficking by coordinating with law enforcement agencies throughout the state. Diversion control, holding doctors and pharma companies accountable for overprescribing or skirting the law, which could mean losing their licenses or abilities to prescribe. And a community outreach to engage schools, churches and grassroots groups to promote prevention. We are specifically targeting those individuals that are bringing the drugs into New Jersey, absolutely. And as we know, most of the fentanyl and the heroin is coming from China or Mexico. Most of the time, folks focus completely just on violence, on the homicides and things that are happening. And most of those things are happening because of their relationship to drugs. Essex County leads the state in the number of drug-related overdose deaths, with 156 so far for 2018, and over 1,200 statewide, according to the Attorney General's office. Nationally, there are 174 drug overdose deaths per day, according to the CDC. Just in one of our major Newark hospitals, there's been over 500 percent uh, diagnosis in ER visits due, due to opioids, uh, an 89 percent increase in hospitalization. Under New Jersey's U.S. Attorney Craig Carpenito, the state started the first ever opioid unit. It's believed to be the only in the country, with six designated criminal prosecutors, a health care fraud unit, and a partnership with the Office of the Attorney General. The average number of cases brought last year by our office, 39. In the three months since our ER, 67. We're up 79 percent. And that's because my folks are working harder. Um, we're, we're, we've redoubled our efforts on this front because we know it's a serious epidemic. Newark has already rolled out the Newark CARES program with the public schools and police department aimed at helping kids who've experienced childhood trauma. The 360 strategy was deployed in South Jersey about six months ago. The DEA won't speak to specifics there, but says they are seeing a decrease in violent crime and the amount of Narcan deployed. It'll take at least a couple of months before they can track results here. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. know the code that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Hoboken, and a new coding school that's girl-centric. Codatum is for boys and girls, but Stevens Institute of Technology graduate student and coding teacher Lindsay Portelli works alongside founder Steve Fink to create an environment where girls are given the resources they need 
to thrive at computer science. The after-school coding program for children as young as 10 is held at the Monroe Center. With Codytum, Fink says he aims to work with the Hoboken Public Schools, government, and businesses to attract industry and build a community of coders. He's scheduled a try-it-free day for girls this Sunday. Next to Jersey City, where Anheuser-Busch opened its new office by calling in its big Budweiser Clydesdales, who clip-clopped from Grand Street near the waterfront to City Hall, and even the mayor got to hitch a ride. The Jersey City office is the company's third facility in the state. Together, the company says it employs 350 people and creates $9 million annually in tax revenue. Finally, Livingston, where high school students took a magical mystery tour back in time to the way it was in the rock and roll 50s, more than a decade before Magical Mystery Tour. The all-school lip dub was costumed, choreographed, and recorded by the students as they danced through the decades to celebrate Livingston High's 65th anniversary. And that's the Garden State Express for Thursday, June 7th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Basketball giant Michael Jordan said talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. Some students in Old Bridge have a lot to teach about that. Lauren Wonka reports. Old Bridge High School students are playing a unified basketball game. Unified means that on a level playing field, you have students with and without disabilities playing as partners. When you look and oversee a team, you don't know who's who. There is no us and them on the court. It, we are truly a team. It started in 2010 when four Old Bridge High School juniors told special education teacher Karen Lewicki they wanted to form a club with Karen's students. Karen asked the teens in her class what they wanted to do as an after school activity. They all agreed sports. That was the start of their new club called the Buddy Team. Karen paired athletes, students with intellectual or physical disabilities, with partners, the teens in general education. It's just awesome to see the experience for everyone to have ownership of your school. How great is it for everyone to say, I'm on a team at my high school. In 2011, the club became part of Special Olympics New Jersey Unified Sports. Now the team is called Old Bridge Play Unified and is funded by Special Olympics New Jersey and the Old Bridge Board of Education, says Karen. It's not just about sports. The students meet during the school day in a class specifically designed for their club. There they do team building activities like tying each other's shoes with one hand, passing a ball through each person's curved stick without speaking, or instructing someone to find an object blindfolded. Old Bridge Play Unified now has a little over 100 members. Students can join starting their freshman year, and athletes have the option to remain in the school until they're 21, which means they can stay in the program for six to seven years. Some students are so dedicated that after they graduate, they come back and volunteer whenever they can. Senior Matthew Rosalie hopes to visit next year. He's going to miss Louis Cavana, his partner. They often hang out on the weekends. What do you think of Louis? Lewis, he's, can I say, he's like best friend to me, like a brother to me, really. I love him. Lewis feels the same way about Matthew. It's like best friend for four years. The 19-year-old loves basketball. His favorite part of the game? You pass the ball to your friends. Lewis's mom is thrilled her son's in the program. It's taught him to grow into a young gentleman. He's made some great friendships. He's had some great partners through the years. I think the program is an amazing thing for the high school because kids with and without disabilities come together and they're able to make friends but also have a good time in school. New athlete Paige Giasulo says she's already gained strong friendships. This bond just feels so special, just feels different. Her mom is so proud of the team. She's become more open. She she just has no problem expressing her feelings. I think I think the program too has given her uh, expanded her horizons, so to speak, and learning what all kids are about. Everyone's very um one of a kind, very unique. But we try and find not um 
how people are similar, but how we're different and how we can grow upon that. I love coming to class every day, seeing the athletes just smile and working with the athletes. Now members visit other schools to talk about their nationally recognized club, compete in the Special Olympics, and the unified team even plays against the Old Bridge varsity football and basketball teams. You don't want to take and put somebody on a pedestal and say, look at how different they are. You want to put somebody on the pedestal and say, look how we blend and look how we mold to come to a common answer or on a common ground. The team looks forward to welcoming their newest members this fall. In Old Bridge, I'm Lauren Wonko and Jake TV News. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. In 2017, law enforcement and EMS administered naloxone more than 14,000 times in New Jersey. The current minimum age to marry in New Jersey is 16 with parental consent. There are currently six medicinal marijuana dispensaries in New Jersey. And former New Jersey State Senator Ray Lesniak first filed suit to overturn the sports betting ban in 2009. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, Governor Murphy aims to expand apprenticeship programs. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. WJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.